Welcome to Marketers Talking Marketing. Welcome to another episode of Marketers Talking. Today, we are back to my favorite topic, SEO. We're chatting with Doug. Doug, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on, Jess. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Doug Bradley, owner of Everest Legal Marketing. Uh, we work with specifically law firms, usually small, medium-sized law firms, um, doing their website design, uh, content, search engine optim optimization strategies, uh, and that's primarily what we do. Yeah. Now, you recently published an article that I saw on kind of a hot take on SEO. Oh, yeah. Hot take on Google. Why don't you tell the audience about it? Yeah, well, I, I think it's something that, um, you know, we, we've been seeing for quite some time, but as marketers, uh, I think um, when we look at Google search results, we're looking for the things that we expect to see. And it seems more and more as time has gone on, especially in the last, say, six to 12 months or so, I think people in general, not just SEO people, are starting to see that the search results they're finding in Google aren't necessarily very relevant to what they were searching. And, um, you know, it's kind of like that old adage of the frog in the boiling pot. It doesn't necessarily know that the heat is rising, but we're now at that tipping point where people that are not in the SEO industry, that are not in the marketing industry, are starting to look at search results and saying, what the heck am I looking at here? There's, it's crowded with ads that, and, and half the content is irrelevant to what I've actually searched for. And so we're actually yeah. starting to see a decline in usage of Google um, based off of that. Where do you see people going? Are they going to Bing or are they going to like AI for the answer? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. And it, I think it also depends on what you're looking for. Um, I think people, I mean, largely the market share is still in Google's favor. I mean, they were, they've been at uh, high 90s, low, or excuse me, high 80s, low 90s market share for, for a very long time. Uh, and what we're seeing is uh, Google searches market share is starting to decline a little bit over the last year. They've declined by about 4% or so, and other search engines are starting to rise, not at the same rate at which Google's market share is declining, but we're starting to see the shift in consumer behavior and people's behavior is leaning towards alternative search mechanisms like Bing or DuckDuckGo or uh, SGE or different variations of a search that give a better result when you're searching for something specifically. So it sounds like there isn't one key player that's really taking over that market share. Because if there was, we would see one competitor rising relative to how Google is dropping, but really everyone's kind of filling in. I tell you, I still use Google quite a bit, but I'm either using like Google image search or I'm using perplexity to give me an answer. And there's yeah. been a couple times where I'm Googling something and I go, hold on what am I doing? Like, this is my default action, but it's not going to give me the best result. And then I go over to chat GPT or perplexity and I search my thing and it gives me exactly what I need. Uh, I I'm definitely doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and, I know what's really as, doing it. as these tools become, you know, kind of more ubiquitous and easier to access and people are more familiar with them, um, that, that behavior may solidify into uh, a core consumer behavior. You know, I grew up in, you know, I graduated high school in 96. So my whole high school education almost was never using Google. Um, it, but at some point I started to get more comfortable with it and then it just became the de facto search. And I think that's what's happening now with people is that they're, they're seeing that there's alternatives and they're starting to maybe even trust those alternatives a little bit more. Yeah. I, my biggest complaint uh, in general is I feel like Google taught us how to search with Boolean queries mm -hmm, sure. and Google really trained us. Well, maybe AOL keyword search started it. Yeah. I feel like Google really trained us on how to search and searching with like a Boolean query versus being a human question, not like ask Jeeves was like my favorite one back in the day. And now my Google home has started to be more human. And if I give it my prompt in like a Boolean query type prompt mm -hmm. of turn this light to this percentage, it doesn't know what I'm saying and it doesn't respond to me. But if I say like, turn the lights down in whatever room, it'll listen to me. Yeah. And I feel like Google trained us to be really specific and to modify our input to match what they wanted. And now all these other tools are like, no, 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 no. Just be yourself. Like, I, I understand what you're saying. And it's hard to undo how we've been trained to search. Yeah. And, and those tools are getting better at it 
I think at a faster rate that Google might be getting better at it. Um, now with uh, chat GPT, you can continue conversations that you've had in the past yeah. and it picks it back up and it realizes responses and queries that have been generated so it can give you better results uh, and better information that's dialed into a previous conversation. So yeah. those types of things are definitely interesting. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, the, the age of the, what we, what we expect on Google to be found, I think that's changing. And, and I think marketers are seeing that. And I think the general public is starting to see that as well. Yeah. Do you have a favorite search engine that's not Google? <laughs> uh, that's not Google. Yeah. Um, I, I still, I actually, for, for as much criticism as I have of Google and, and, and there's a fair share to go around the industry, I still use Google, Google as my list. default, but I think in the last, in the last six weeks, I'm starting to validate my searches on being, I'm looking at being mm. in what, what results are different on being, what is being look, you know, serving on page one and page two as the most rele relevant for a search. And I'm starting to kind of cross-reference them and look at uh, more and more uh, because we're seeing that being at least from, you know, what Stack Counter and some of these other tracking uh, websites look at, that Bing is starting to grow in usage. So it's only natural if you're an SEO to start looking at Bing and comparing results and seeing how to tweak it. So I'm starting to use Bing a little bit more myself. Yeah. I feel like for a lot of people, they don't necessarily know about other search engines aside from Google and Bing too. So if they're like, where do I go? Like, let me pull up the one that comes in my browser that I use at work because maybe they're at an enterprise where they're locked down and don't have Google Chrome as an option. Right. So they're, they're pushing to Bing with it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then other people are using, um, you know, social media more like, uh, one of the stats I had heard a while back was how much people, especially in Gen Z are looking at TikTok for product queries. And that mm -hmm. to me blows my mind. I can't even think about, I, I can't even imagine that as someone who doesn't use TikTok very much. Yeah. I, someone was telling me the other day that they use TikTok as their main search engine mm -hmm. and it blew my mind. And then it made me question if I'm like, am I old? Yeah. Am I, am I out of touch? With the exactly. youth of today. So yeah. I've been trying to use, I've been trying to use TikTok for search more when I'm trying to get like a little video on how to do something because mm -hmm. it's pretty short. And I found that sometimes it is helpful. Yeah. As yeah. long as you're comfortable with like a short duration of a video to watch. Yeah. I think especially if you're, if, and I think you hit the nail on the head there is that if, if you're looking for a, a, a quick piece of information um, and it's more of a visual query and you want to see something, I think that TikTok, I think, and and YouTube Shorts and other types of short format videos are really ideal for that. Um, being in the legal industry, um, we focus on our 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 users, the people who are consuming the information from a lawyer's website. They're typically on a research journey, um, and they're really wanting to find out who the attorney is, what they've done, what they've accomplished, maybe what they do in their spare time and what, you know, what kind of uh, communities and, and, you know, nonprofits they support. They want to know a little bit about, about that. And so we're still seeing across all of our clients, the vast majority of search still coming in from Google search um, by far. Okay. Is it changing how you're approaching client strategy where you're maybe incorporating these other platforms more or has it had any impact on what you're doing with your clients? Yeah, we're, we're having a lot more conversations about video these days. Um, you know, the adoption rate of video is skyrocketing. Uh, the adop adoption rate of short form video uh, is skyrocketing. Um, we're also starting to talk a little bit more internally and, you know, client facing about making sure that you're being found everywhere and, and diversifying where your traffic's coming from. Um, we don't, we still rely heavily on Google search for the most of our search because that's where it comes from. But I think more and more as time goes on, um, we're going to have to start looking at other platforms more carefully. So when it comes to marketing for law firms, are there some unique challenges that you run into? There's things you have to say for sure. And there's things you have to say in a certain way for sure. Um, but I also think that, um, marketing for law firms the, again, the end user of a law of a law firm's content is someone who doesn't want to hire a lawyer. You know, nobody goes to to Google no, wanting to hire a lawyer. They yeah. need to hire a lawyer. Um, if I go to TikTok because I want to look up a cool watch uh, to buy, it's because I want to buy a watch. 
Um, if I go to anywhere else, it's because you, you're wanting to buy something, you're wanting to hire someone for a service for something cool that you're doing. It's very rare that in the law, um, you're, you're hiring someone for a positive reason. It's mostly negative leaning. And so, unfortunately, you kind of have to market to that a little bit more is solving the problem and making sure you establish that lawyer as the person who's best to hire to solve that problem. Are people then, if they're coming and they're searching when they have a need, mm -hmm. it feels yeah. like the idea of making that lawyer top of mind mm -hmm. might be less prevalent when it comes to being found online in today's day and age. I'm thinking back to like the early 90s when I would see the same commercials on TV with the same yeah. jingle. And the goal was to make it like you get into an accident, you think of Habish, Habish and Rotier or yeah. <laughs> whoever it is at the time. Yeah. Is it, yeah. is it less built on that? I think for some it is, yeah, and that's why SEO lends itself so well to law firms. Um, I started my advertising career in Yellow Pages, and I quickly learned at that time that there's some just directional types of industries where there's, the demand is already built in. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you don't really need to tell people they need a lawyer. If they need a lawyer, they probably very well know that they need a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, they may not, but they probably know already, and so whatever is available uh, at that moment, you know, in the back then, yellow pages were the big ticket. You yeah. know. It wasn't uncommon to see what they called double truck or double page ads in yellow pages filled, uh, you know, 40 pages deep with double truck ads. Uh, and each of those advertisers was paying anywhere from five to $10,000 a month for those double page ads. Oh, Whoa. yeah. Oh, yeah. And that a major is... market. Yeah, in a major market. That's so much more than I thought it would be. <laughs> I'm here in Southern California, and the like the Los Angeles market, San Diego market, San Francisco markets. It was, it was uh, definitely in that price range. But it wow. was because people, the demand is so high, and the average client value is so high that it just the the complexity of the competition is just very fierce, and it lends itself to search engine optimization where people are already need a lawyer. We just need to make sure that we find, they find our client. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess back in the day, everyone had a phone book yeah. in their house. Yeah. I remember my grandparents had a stack of like 10 because mm -hmm. they would never throw them out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they they always had a phone them, book. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't want to get rid of them. Yeah, because they had the notes. They crossed out who they didn't like <laughs> and all that. And so, yeah, yeah, everyone had one. Every phone in public that you'd go to, every pay phone. Yeah. I forgot the word pay phone for a minute there, but every pay phone had one bound to it. Yeah, we, we don't yeah. We, we, uh, a lot of younger people don't know that time, but SEO really is that that's really was built off of it's built in demand. So if mm -hmm. you're in an industry where there's built in demand, obviously SEO is going to flourish for that as a marketing yeah. mechanism. Yeah. Your intent is there. Yeah. And usually you're, yep. Yeah. A hundred percent. I always think it's interesting because I feel like some of, uh, some of the companies that rely heavily on local SEO aren't always as cutting edge as companies that rely on the internet for sales. I think about my plumber who recently updated to actually having like text message confirmation for appointments. And they started working with a marketing firm that totally overhauled their local SEO. And they went from being like a pretty decent company. But again, with plumbing, you tend to call your plumber when your toilet is leaking mm -hmm. and there's water going everywhere and right. you need someone in an emergency. So their whole idea for a long time was people know to call us. We're the only one in town. Like we mm -hmm. don't need to market. Like mm -hmm. we drive around town, people see our truck, we're good. Yeah. And then they started switching to actually using a, a local SEO strategy, having a website designed to convert, having SEO heavy content that isn't a hundred percent focused on call us when your pipe breaks, but how do you winterize your house, all that type of stuff. And they quadrupled their business in a month. Yeah. And they're like, why didn't we do this 10 years ago? Yep. Yep. And that, and lawyers are very similar in that way. And sometimes, you know, when an industry, a small business, whether it be an HVAC person or a plumber or a lawyer, they don't necessarily know what the importance of those things are. Uh, like article writing. Why should I write an article? If people need a lawyer, they're just going to Google lawyer. Well, not necessarily always, or why should I winterize my pipes? Right. And I think with, with smaller businesses where their expertise is what they do, I think there's a certain amount of education um, that goes along with adding value to what we do as SEO professionals and as marketers. We need to educate them a bit. Like, you need this so that way 
you can uh, get these types of search volumes to your website and maybe get some inbound links to that article. You know, things like that. They don't really necessarily understand the value of that. Where do you think search is going in 2024? <laughs> um, gosh, I, w I, I wish I knew the answer to that um, wholeheartedly so I could adjust my investment strategies. Um, I would say it's it, it's definitely going to be marketers and consumers behaving differently in order to get traffic from a wide variety of sources. Um, I think we all used to lean on, especially in SEO, we all used to lean on the old Reliab and Google yeah. um, to deliver nearly 100% of our traffic, but we're finding that that's not true. Um, so I think we're gonna need to target more platforms uh, as marketers and clients and our customers will have to do that as well. Um, and I think we're all gonna start to learn more about how to use AI effectively and responsibly um, and make sure that we're not just taking whatever an AI tool outputs and putting it onto a page. So that way we can check a box that we published a blog this month. I will say before AI existed, there was still trash content on the internet. Oh, yeah. Like not everything human produced is good, but the <laughs> volume of just trash content I have seen in the last six months has exponentially raised from this time last year. I think Google's algorithm, unfortunately, has rewarded a lot of those sites um, that are much larger sites with a huge domain authority. And um, uh, I think they're starting to hopefully pull back a little bit on the reward of those sites. But yeah, AI is definitely somewhere we're going to need to uh, focus on being even more efficient um, and more proficient about using that content. How do we use it? Um, I still personally employ several legal writers, most of whom are actual attorneys to write our content, but I know that they're using ChatGPT and other sources to generate ideas, to maybe uh, set up the framework for an article, because those are great ways to use AI, but I need their professional talent and their knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and their expertise to write that content for our clients. Yeah, you still need the human in the loop to make sure that it's actually applicable. Yeah. I feel like there's laws so nuanced too. Mm -hmm. Oh, Depending yeah. Depending on, yeah. The state, what? the city sometimes that, mm -hmm. that a client's located in. Um, there was a, a case last year, I believe it was last year, where a lawyer went and uh, cited a case that they found on ChatGPT, and it was a completely made up case. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I know an individual I'm friends with, um, I believe his wife works for the same firm. And it was an attorney who was older who just didn't didn't realize that AI hallucinates. Mm -hmm. And I think back to how many people don't know they're being advertised to in Facebook ads mm -hmm. or how many people are just not digitally literate where they can't recognize it. Sure. So AI definitely introduces like a huge challenge. I mean, we've we've seen so I use AI a ton for kind of the early stage of content generation before it goes to human for that finessing. Mm -hmm. And there's been times where I'm like, give me a quote. And I'll give me a quote with a stat and a link to TechCrunch. Mm -hmm. And I'll look and I'll be like, like, I know the company you're talking about. And you just made up a name that is not their CEO or that is not their backstory. But when you read it, it sounds really compelling. Right. And unless you know, you don't know that it's wrong. And then you start Googling and you're like, hold on, I can't find that article. And then you kind of push AI, AI into a corner. And then it says, you wanted an article. I gave you an article. Like you wanted a reference. I gave you a reference. Yeah, I made it up, but it's what you asked for. So like, leave me alone. Yeah. And it'll go down a whole rabbit hole to try and cover its butt <laughs> when it lies about stuff. Yeah, I think I think uh, people who use AI, just in general, the general public, I think everybody's going to have to learn how to be more savvy using these tools. Uh, you know, when ChatGPT first came out, uh, what was it? it was only about a year ago, maybe a little longer than a year ago. Yeah. Nobody knew that it hallucinated. Yeah. We knew that it made up information. So we looked at it and we were using it and we're, you know, I think people got really comfortable using, wow, this thing can produce this information immediately. Yeah. And it's obviously pulling it from factual sources so we can use this. And and they didn't realize, and I didn't, nobody knew really at that time until it started to come out that, wow, yeah, it really will just, you know, give false information. It's going to do what you ask it to do regardless right. of what you want it to do. Right, right, right. <laughs>
and it will give you information and maybe misinformation. How have you seen Google search results change recently and how they're presented? Google, for the most part, is still trying to deliver the most relevant information to users. And I think that's still their core competency is that. But we've also seen um, over the last few years and even more recently, um, a huge push towards forum delivery, uh, delivering forums into results, uh, sometimes even preceding the most relevant organic results. You might do a search for something and uh, a Reddit and Quora forum links will appear as the number one, two, and three results. I've a... noticed Quora showing up in a lot of search results for me, actually. Yeah. 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 For, forums, uh, like I said, and I mentioned this in, in, in that article that I had written, is it just seems like they're even forums that are wildly outdated from 5, 10, 15 years ago are populating on page one of search results for queries, which is, that's weird. That's a weird yeah. thing. Even if the information might still be applicable, something that's that old, should we rely on that information? That's weird. Um, but we're also seeing, uh, you know, different things pop into Google search results. We're seeing ads, more ads in the middle of organic results. Um, we're seeing lots of results that generate more searches. Um, you know, people also ask is something that seems to come up a lot in a lot of informational types of searches and it just generates a new search often if you click on a link and it just brings up a new search. Yeah. Um, so the space I think in search results pages is getting a bit more crowded and we're gonna have to be creative uh, more so as marketers in order to catch users' attention. Do you think the first page is as valuable as it was five years ago? Probably not. Uh, and the reason for that is because you've got infinite scrolling uh, you know, with, with search results, I mean, you scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll, and it doesn't get to, you know, the bottom of page five or six that it actually prompts you to refresh a page. Um, so it's, uh, the, the adage, you know, the page two is the new page one. It kind of seems true. <laughs> I think SEOs uh, were benefited from when Google made that change. Um, but I, I definitely think, especially for local firms that uh, and local businesses that that space inside of maps is far more valuable. I think people um, are using maps and the local section of Google more so now than they were in the past. Oh yeah. It always actually annoys me a little bit when I'm looking for a business and I'll see them on Google maps and I'll click in and they don't have their profile fully set up. Oh man. That's, it's that's like, now let's go back to Google and find your website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I want to find the SEO person who does your work and I yeah. want to send them an email. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> It's if anyone's listening and they need a prospecting method, like that's probably a good way to find yeah. SEO clients. Yeah, that's look at... brain though, because we, you know, we don't look at we we look at the yeah. title tags and the H one before we look at the. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Or I'm like, you have no photos. Add yeah. photos. No, photos, no videos, no awards, no, uh, yeah. no nothing, no pictures. Um, yeah. But you know, yeah, those but are. Awkward. I know you exist. <laughs> And you're good at what you do. Why do you only have three reviews? Yeah, I have definitely, um, this will shock no one. I've definitely provided feedback to businesses on that before <laughs> where I've like gone in to like pick up takeout and be like, hey, if you just like pass along to your owner, like you guys really need to fix your SEO on the website. How's that information received? Um, sometimes it's actually received really well. <laughs> so there was someone I was speaking to the other day and their website was actually down. And so I went through and I, and okay, I'm I'm a little bit extra sometimes. So I went through and I looked and I was like, oh, you're hosting on WordPress.com. Yeah. You should really start self-hosting on like an actual hosting provider and right. have a CDN that will cache it and blah, blah, blah. And I like wrote it all out. And they're like, wow, thank you so much. Like that's actually something we've been thinking about. We didn't know where to go. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for web dev firms? Like, yeah. how can we do this? Yeah. There's other times where they're like, thanks, we got a guy that does this. Like, <laughs> well, your site was down for three days. <laughs> right. So I don't know who you're using, but I hope yeah. you don't pay them. Yeah. Like I also find myself, uh, oftentimes I'll look at a business and they're miscategorized and you're like, wait a yeah. second, why is this person in this category? They are definitely not that there's nothing on their website. I know that business. They don't do that. And so I'll just, you know, kind of for fun, reclassify them into the most appropriate, you know, primary category. Yeah. <laughs> just because it can't, I like neur neurotics, 
uh, you look at it and you go, that's not right. That needs to be right. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? They probably, because I think on that case, they get the confirmation or they get the the prompt to confirm the updated information. Because oh, yeah. you can do it on Facebook yeah. too. Yep. And I feel like someone's looking and they're going, no, 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 no. We're in the right category. And yeah. They're just rejecting it. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I would say I get responses probably five to 10% of the time. And typically, I would say of the five to 10% of responses, 80% are, thank you. I didn't know, especially if I see, if I like bought a product recently and then I get retargeted with mm -hmm. an ad, mm -hmm. I will message the marketer and be like, Hey, you're not excluding <laughs> uh, conversions from yeah. your audiences. Like I'm that person. Most of the time it's thank you. Like genuinely like, thank you. Appreciate it. Part of like, you know, some of the time it's like, I got a guy for it. Don't worry. Like whatever. We don't need it. Most of the time I never hear back, yeah. but I will sometimes notice updates. Yeah. I will notice that, or if they have an, an ad running and the text is cropped off mm -hmm. or they're using the wrong size image for mobile, yeah. I'll notice that it changed and updated. So I like to think that I'm having an impact somewhere. You had because it does. improving that marketing. <laughs> yeah. Cause it, it also annoys me. Yeah. When I see it, I, yeah, I'm, I got a lot of points for contributing to Google maps. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I, I, I like to contribute, uh, reviews. I like to make updates to things because to things, I think it helps. I think it helps a business owner. Yeah. I think it helps users. I think, I think people genuinely help it. Um, I once, a uh, quick anecdote, uh, I was once at the beach with my family and uh, we, we all wanted pizza. So I found this place where pizza place just down the street, it said dine in. We got there starving. It was definitely not dine in. Oh. And so we ate pizza in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, we were going to drive another twenty minutes somewhere else, and then you know wait there, and and so, uh, but things like that really do impact, um, you know, how how businesses display and, and the value of the information on yeah. Google Maps. You know? I I really think someone's going to listen to some and just roll their eyes, but I really think the unsung heroes of the internet are nerds like us who <laughs> do that and edit listings and yeah. like i used to edit wikipedia pages a well, time. I just to bring that up yeah yeah definitely yeah. some heroes at, at wikipedia yeah because <laughs> yeah, it, it is what, what i think is interesting on the business side is you sure. essentially have a community building your product mm -hmm. and so for google like i also i submit i'm in an area where there's a lot of new construction and so I will submit roads when they get completed too, and I'll yeah. go and put it on. And so you essentially have this like army that's helping you build a better product because they want a better consumer experience. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, kind of tying this back to Google, um, I think Google's using that to their benefit more so to the benefit of users these days. And yeah. I think that's what's causing the problem is they're, they're leveraging that information and they're displaying it in results, but they're not necessarily always attributing a way back to the website that provided that information. Um, you know, that, and that to me is the piece where marketers and businesses are like, well, why even do this? Why even yeah. spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year on this or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year if, if we're not getting traffic, if we're not getting recognized for this? Yeah. Well, Google doesn't, the Google doesn't care about giving you traffic. Oh, yeah. They care about having the right answer or the sure. answer that keeps people engaged. Sure. It reminds me uh. of, it reminds me of Pinterest mm -hmm. back in the day. Pin, this whole podcast is us just talking about things that kids these days, marketers these days, the young <laughs> ones don't understand. <laughs> but Pinterest, when they started rolling out rich pins, they rolled out a rich recipe pin. Mm -hmm. And so it would show you the entire recipe on your pin. And at the time I was working with a couple large recipe websites and they were up in arms. Like we're not using rich pins anymore because they lost all their website traffic. Yeah. They saw like, and they were getting like 80, 90% of their social referral traffic was Pinterest mm -hmm. and they saw it cut in half mm -hmm. because Pinterest now displayed the recipe. So you didn't have to leave Pinterest. Yeah. They were yeah. so upset about it. Yeah. No. And, and, and I think business owners and website owners, have a right to be upset about that. If we if we are creating information, we want to have people come to our website. We want I yeah. want people to come to my client's website because I want the opportunity for there to be a business transaction there. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily want it. I'm I'm happy that the information's on Google, but I want people to come to the website. Yeah. 
even on like the restaurant side, you can order straight through your same search window, yeah. right? Because I think it's integrated with a couple different yeah. Grubhub, delivery. Yeah, yeah, Uber Eats, yeah. That's another yeah. thing, you know, I, I refuse to use any of those services because the margins they take are just so astronomically high. I would rather go to the restaurant's website, order through their website, yeah. Or call them up in order and go pick it up rather than yeah. give Uber Eats or whatever these other ones are, like 30 or 40% of the transaction value. It's to me, I guess I'm the weirdo because they're billion dollar companies, but I just, my brain thinks that way. Yeah. And they mark up the price of the food. Oh, yeah. 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 I didn't sure. realize that. I ordered from Noodles the other day and we're a family of four. So we each got like our own thing of noodles and it was almost $60. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? the heck is going on here like yeah. that's crazy we're gonna drive five minutes down the road and go order there and it was half the price yeah and it was yeah, yeah everything was marked up and then there was uh like a service fee and then a delivery fee right right um and then and yeah. then if you don't tip the driver then they get upset you know it's yeah. and to me it seems like there's really not a whole and and by the way there was a recent study or a recent uh, news article that those companies aren't even really making money anymore. so uh, or they don't make money or they haven't made money yet so nobody's really winning in this scenario. Like yeah. you know, Uber, Uber Eats isn't winning or, or, you know, the Grubhub and these things, they're not winning. Uh, the consumer is, is maybe winning, um, but the business owner isn't winning. <laughs> the driver yeah. is winning. Um, and so, yeah, things like that to me get under my skin. And, and right now it's, it seems like Google, you know, it's the 800 pound gorilla. They, they just seem to be taking more than they're giving mm -hmm. uh, at, at the moment. Which is so funny because their whole ethos is like, do no harm. Hmm. Well, but you look at the best product Google ever launched was Google Reader, which they destroyed um, back in the day. But you look at Google Voice, like Google Voice was free because they used it to train their NLP. Hmm. Like everything they do has an ulterior motive that benefits Google. They're not... Yeah. They're not in the business of making consumers' lives better. Yeah. They're in the business of making money. <laughs> and they're in the business of making it seem like they're in the business of making consumer yeah. lives you know? <laughs> They're lying to you, everyone. They're lying. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and I mean, I know there's a, we, we've talked a, a huge amount about, you know, our my, your um, hatred of the things that Google does. But at the end of the day, I do still think that they're rooted in that they want to deliver good results. They want user satisfaction. Yes. I think they've lost their way. I think I think right now they've moved from a focus on the user model to a focus on the investor model. And mm -hmm. I think that's that I think the pendulum's getting ready to swing at Google. Yeah. I was thinking it's really interesting what they've done with GA4 mm -hmm. compared to the data that's available in GA because the data's all there. They're just not making it accessible anymore. Yeah. But I can guarantee you that they are they have it internally. So now Google's almost putting up this walled garden of, we can see what is helping the website perform. Like we can see all of the variables and all the metrics that have a correlation with a good user experience in our mind and, and retention and time on site. We can see all those metrics, but we're not gonna show them to you. Mm -hmm. We're gonna use them for us to measure so you can't see them, so you can't influence them. And we'll leave you to guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, uh, yeah. The whole shift from UA to GA four. Um, I don't think there's many marketers who think it was uh, a grand success, myself included. It just seems like there's it, Universal Analytics was so easy to use. Yeah, uh, and I know it had its some you know deficiencies uh, and whatnot, but it just seems like when you're looking at GA four, you get lost. You gotta you gotta Google or go to YouTube to find out where to find oh, yeah. pieces of information sometimes. Oh yeah, Chat GPT. Yeah, and perplexity <laughs> have been my best friend in like, how do I find this? Yeah. Like, how do I find, I just want my user flows. I can't yeah. find my user flows for this segment. How do I do it? Right, right. And they're like, it's okay. Everyone gets frustrated by this. Here's how. So then also chat GPT and perplexity, I feel like make me feel good about being confused. I get Google confused just, every month. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Google just makes me feel like a dumb yeah. dumb. Yeah. Because yeah. I was in my entire career in tech, but I can't figure out how to build a report. <laughs> uh, oh, well, that's a great spot for us to wrap this. <laughs> Doug, yeah, if yeah. people are looking to learn more about you and connect, where do they go? Um, I mean, straight to my website, everestlegalmarketing.com. I'm fairly active on Twitter. Um, those are the places really that I, I, I kind of post the most. I, I do tend to blog quite often. 
um, I guess quite often, you know, it, 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 some, some would say it's quite often, but, um, but yeah, th those are the places the best find me. Great. And we will link everything in the show notes below. And if you have any questions, comments, want to hear more, drop a comment below also. See everyone in the next episode. Thanks so much for having me.